It's good to be here, isn't it? Isn't it good to have God with us and meet with us? It's good to be reminded of, of the God who saved us and walks with us. Um, really, this is probably a message that a lot of farmers are going to be able to relate to. Uh, Claire, I'm sure you'll, you'll pay attention. But the title of this message, uh, Adam, if you'll throw that up there, it's all about the dirt. Okay? It's all about the dirt. And it actually comes from Jesus Christ. Um, so, yeah, I guess we didn't get rid of the windows. Good old Microsoft, always messing with me. Um, it's really a, a parable that Jesus gave, a parable of the sower. Um, and I'd like to share that parable with you. I realized as I was loading the PowerPoint and, and going through my notes and marking it for Adam to know what frame to put up, that I left out somehow two frames, didn't get saved once you make the edits, and if you don't save it, then you don't keep the edits. So, my, so I'm going to have to turn around and read it with you guys on the last two frames of the Scripture. These are from the, um, the contemporary English version, if, if you're ever wondering. <coughs> kind of like it um, as I struggled with the new international version that has um, boy you know if you can't say anything nice don't say anything at all right yeah I know that I need to teach shy away from the, the latest version of the new international version okay and I'll just leave it that's kind and uh, not real thrilled with their standards being lowered um, but um, I, 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 this one's okay. It, it's, it's not the, the word for word exactly, but it does a pretty good job. Um, and the standards, is, as they put it together, is pretty good. But anyhow, this is the parable of the sower. Adam, try to keep up if you can. I did make it bigger. That's a good sign. All right. The same day, Jesus went out to the house, and he sat beside the sea. Actually, if you read other accounts, he actually got into a boat to give these, this message, his sermon. And a great crowd gathered about him, so he got in, oh, there it is. So he got into the boat, and he sat down, and the whole crowd stood on the beach. And uh, he told them many things in parables, saying, A sower went out to sow, and as he sowed, some seeds fell on the path, and the birds came and devoured them. Other seeds fell on the rocky ground where they did not have much soil. Immediately they sprang up. But since they had no depth of soil, um, but when the sun rose, they were scorched. And, and since they had no root, they withered away. <coughs> Other seeds fell among the thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked them. And other seeds fell on good soil and produced grain, some a hundredfold, some sixty, and some thirty. And then Jesus said, He who has ears, let him hear. I think it's kind of ironic that I'm having troubles with, with my ears today. Maybe the Lord's preaching to me. Um, for our guests, I only have one, actually one ear that works. This one has definitely been that way since childhood. But this one, this one uh, conveniently just decided to act up last night. My wife would say something to me, and I'd go, huh, I can tell you're talking, but it just sounds like gobbledygook. It was interesting. I was hoping after taking some medication it would be better today. But he who has the ears, let him hear. And then the scriptures go on to tell the purpose of the parables, <clears throat> with verse uh, 10 there in Matthew, the 13th chapter. And then the disciples came and they said to him, Why do you speak to them in parables? And he answered them, To you it has been, uh, has been given uh, to know the secrets of the kingdom of heaven, but to them it's not been given. For to the ones who has, more will be given, and he will have an abundance. But from the ones who, ha who has not, even what he has will be taken away. This is why I speak to them in parables, because seeing they do not see, and hearing they do not hear, nor do they understand. Indeed, <clears throat> in their case, the prophecy of Isaiah is fulfilled that says, you will indeed hear, but never understand. You will indeed see, but never perceive. For this people's heart 
has grown dull. And with their eyes, they can barely, um, and, and with their ears, they can barely hear, and with their eyes, they, they, they have clothes, lest they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and turn, and I would heal them. <clears throat> but blessed are your eyes, for they see, and your ears, for they hear. For truly I say to you, many prophets and the righteous people long to see what you see and did not see it, and to hear what you hear and did not hear it. <clears throat> now, <clears throat> he gives the translation of what it means. Go ahead, Adam, those last two verses. Um, there we go. Hear then the parable of the sower. When anyone hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the evil one comes and snatches away what has been sown in his heart. That is what was sown along the path. As for what was sown on the rocky ground, this is the one who hears the word and immediately receives it with joy, yet has no root in himself, but endures for a while. And then when, when tribulation or persecution arises on account of the word, immediately he falls away. As for what was sown among the thorns, this is the one who hears the word, but cares, uh, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of, of riches choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. As for what was sown on the good soil, this is the one who hears the word and understands it. He indeed bears fruit and yields in one, in, in one case a hundredfold, in another sixty, and in another thirty. <clears throat> Father, I've just read your word. I'm going to take a few moments to in, 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 in just dig deeper. I want to say in, enlighten. I know that you certainly are teaching me. But I ask, Holy Spirit, that you would teach that which only you can. And I certainly am not going to do this without your help. And I thank you for the inspiration that brought it. And I thank you, Lord, for the help that you gave me in the preparation. Make known to us what you want us to understand, that we might hear with our ears and see with our eyes and comprehend in our hearts so that we are changed. This is my prayer. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> Um, there is a direct link, a direct, a direct um, link between the soil and hearing and seeing. Um, there is a direct link uh, between the heart as well and listening and seeing. Um, our ears and our eyes are working in cooperation with our hearts and our our. They're just tied together. And Jesus said it in so many ways, in so many various places. But I want, to, I want to stay on target here. I don't want us to get lost because it's all about the dirt. And what you need to understand about the dirt is that the dirt signifies our heart. And it's all about our heart. You see, for the longest time, I thought that this parable was about evangelism. And it is to some degree because we're dealing with hearts. And as, as the word is sown, you know, evangelistically, people have not heard. It's, it's about that. But it's about more than that. It's about the church. It's about us as well. And it's not just about evangelism. You know, I thought it was, but that we were to keep on sowing, mostly because at that time in my life, my pastor presented it to me that way. But you see, as I study this and as I read it, God is opening my eyes. He's, I, I'm hearing him loud and clear, and he's saying to me, Carl, it's way more than evangelism. It's way more than just faithfully sowing the word. It is also about where we are in our hearts and where we are with our vision and where we are with our hearing um, abilities and comprehension. I'll be honest with you, what I've discovered over the years, and I've, um, I know that Debbie says it, but I've had a lot of people say that, that you listen better than most. I don't know if it's because I'm, you know, it's the, the, um, the fact that, that I do a lot of counseling, and so you, 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 
practice your hearing. I know that we can practice our listening skills, but I know in counseling you have to teach yourself to listen well. And when you think you're here and you're not certain to ask questions, and so you'll, oftentimes the person across from me will, I'll, I'll clarify just to make sure I'm hearing them well. And then sometimes I hear what they don't know what I'm, that they're even saying. And I'll stop them and say, do you realize what you've just said? You see, our, our, our listening abilities as a nation, we, 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 we just, it's not, that, it's not that, that great. It's not that well. And so this, this, this whole sermon is about our listening abilities and our seeing, our perceptions, and our understanding, and our heart condition. It's about how we deal with sermons, with Bible devotions, and Bible studies. Um, when was the last time your understanding has changed? As we get older, one of the things that I'm concerned about, even as I get older, I want to always be learning. And I want to not just learn about God. I want God to take that which He is teaching me to transform my life. I don't want to be the same as I was yesterday. I want to be a better husband today. I want to be a better follower of Jesus today, better than I was yesterday. I want to work with my coworkers in a greater capacity and have greater influence. I want to let my light shine when theirs is in darkness that they might see the way to the one who changes us. Can I get an amen? Hey, look at, uh, you know, it's just being even better at how to be fruitful and productive as the, we walk with Jesus and we allow his word to get in our lives. And I think there's a danger. I know that I have thought it. That the longer you walk, I've been with Jesus for like some 40-some years. And the longer I, you know, you, okay, he's going to preach. I know all about that. I'm a preacher. I've studied all about You know, when then I turn on the radio and it's like, no, Lord, no, Lord. Teach me what you want me to know today. Help me to be different. Teach me what you, what, what you want Jackie, who's a teacher, to teach me. Jackie, sorry I missed class today. I had a lot of fixing to do. And don't let me just go into her class and take over. Those of you who are in her class know that a lot of times I just sit there and I sit way off so that I don't. That I might learn. I want God to teach me and keep me fresh. I think this is what Jesus was driving at. It wasn't just about evangelism. It was about, it was about opening our ears and our eyes and, and hearing and perceiving. If I look at Luke's account of this particular parable, we've, I've read to you Matthew's account. Here's how he concludes. Here's how he closes. And, and by the way, I noticed that Matthew... Matthew, in both sections, in the explanation of Jesus, Jesus repeated himself in a couple places that you would, be, that you would be, yield a great crop. He'd be very fruitful, a hundredfold, sixtyfold, thirtyfold. He said it twice. It was for emphasis that you produce, that something is happening and that fruit is rising. We, we, we love to hear sermons about the fruit of the Spirit. Amen? The fruit of the Spirit. Well, the whole point is, is that God places His Spirit in us that we might yield something. And it isn't something that would naturally come out of us. It's something that is God-planted and God-led and God-anointed that changes us and transforms us to be like Jesus Christ. Oh, to be like him. Oh, to be like him. I don't know about you, but that's what I want. Is that what you want? Amen? To be like Jesus. Is it even possible? Yes. Unless we become like him, we can't even enter. And I know that it's possible it's the message of the church. It's the message that God has given to the church that people can change. Let's not lose sight of that and that we need to always be changing and growing and learning. 
In Luke's account, here's what he said and how he concludes the parable that Jesus told in Luke 8, 15. As for you, as for that in the good soil, he says, they are those who, hearing the word, hold fast in an honest and good heart. He, he heard Jesus when, when Luke heard, he heard Jesus and, and, and he writes, it's, it's about the heart. And that there's this link, as I've said, between our eyes and our ears and our heart. And how we, particularly in how we hear God's word and what we do with God's word. He says, let me, let me just start it over. Luke 8.15 says, For that in the good soil they are those who, hearing the word, hold it fast in an honest and good heart and bear fruit with patience. I like that. I thought, okay, maybe it's just the contemporary English version. So I went through and I had about 10 versions that I, that I compared it with in every version, King James as well, all said the same exact thing. Taking the word into our heart, into a, a good heart, actually. I have great news. You can change the condition of your heart. If it's not where it needs to be, it doesn't have to stay where it is. That God, God has the power to transform us into the likeness of, of Jesus Christ. In the church, we operate in the realm of faith. We believe that with God, all things are possible. If we didn't believe people could, could change, we wouldn't invest so much time, money, and energy in the worship and in the preaching experience. But it is not just the church who operates in the hope uh, that people will change their hearts. God himself believes that people can change. He has left the church uh, behind to point people to the changing agent. His name is Jesus Christ. And there is great hope in Jesus, and we will never be the same. Jesus said that a man will be, if that comes to him, knows his forgiveness, will be born again, and will start a new life, and will begin a, a life of change. How many of you like change? Yeah, not. I'm, I, I often hear preachers say the only, only people that like change are babies. Well, uh, Declan's going to be here next week for uh, this is cool. You know, my youngest grandson. I'm going to get. To, I'm going to get to do a, a baby dedication of my grandson, Declan Phoenix Tenney. I don't. Know, you know, we, we got to work on my son's naming habits. But, but, but Declan doesn't like to get changed. I'm just saying. Not that I'm, I care to try. I just sit back and laugh at my, at my son, uh, my youngest son, as he's busy changing Declan, you know, and I just think he doesn't, Declan doesn't want change. I don't know why I would want change if I had that kind of mess, but he doesn't want change. Nobody really likes change. And yet, don't we desire change? I don't want to be the same person that I once was. I want to be what Jesus initially created me to be. Oh, God, the psalmist said it, change my heart. Change me, Lord. Renew a right spirit in me. Well, because we can change, I would share with you that it's really all about the dirt. Jesus is talking about here. The dirt is really the heart condition. Uh, let's talk some farming, okay? My last church, they were big farmers. I know that Claire's a farmer. I have some other farmers, or at least some gardeners in here. You have a garden? How many of you? Yeah, yeah, Betty's got a garden. You got a, I didn't know you had a garden. That's right. Don't you make David do all the weeding? No, he makes you do the weeding? I'll have to talk to him. Okay, you got a garden, sis? You still gardening? Awesome, awesome. Who else has gardens? Yeah, that's right. Flower gardens, too. That's a lot of fun. Um... I don't do gardening anymore because there's just deer back there behind the parsonage. I love the deer, and I can't keep them. And I thought, you know, um, I put them one year, two years ago, we, we thought, well, we we'll just, we'll just put everything in buckets right next to the house by the back door. They won't come that close. Yeah, right. Boy, the deer ain't good that year, and I got, I got bupkis for all my work. 
And we were counting on some cucumbers and green peppers and some green beans, you know. And they all used buckets. You know, I, hey, anybody need a bucket? I got lots of buckets. But it's all about the dirt. What I know about dirt is good dirt requires attention. You, you, you need to keep the soil good. And the same goes with our hearts. We need, to, we need to keep a right spirit. That's why David said that. Keep a right spirit in me. But, I, but what I know about farmers is, is the big farmers in, in my last church, you know, I had some guys who, you know, a thousand acre farm, you know, it's huge. And they said, if, and, and when I was pastoring in Ohio, it's, it's interesting, when I was pastoring in Ohio, a 300 acre farm was a big farm. And I moved to Iowa and they said, you can't make it on 300 acres. I said, really? And I began to, to notice some things about farming and about dirt. They, they, the farmers pay close attention to the dirt. In fact, a lot of the commercials, they, uh, when they're selling, uh, the first time I moved to Iowa, we, we didn't know what co- uh, corn boards were, all right? It, it was really fascinating the first time I saw it. They had this TV commercial, and they had eating through our TV screen, kind of, corn board, you know, and it's like worms, and I was like, ooh, you know, and they had them crawling over the screen. I was like, what's this? Where did we move to? You know, and then, of course, Roundup is going to take care of all that. But farmers pay attention to the dirt. If you're a farmer and you, you plant some crops, let's say corn, year after year, what eventually happens to your soil? And more importantly, to your yield. You know, yield is. It's what Jesus called fruitfulness. What happens if you just keep planting corn? Something happens to the soil. And so, what what? What, what were some of the remedies that they did? They, they would test the soil. They, if, if, if they wanted to plant more corn, they knew they would have to add some nutrients, certain types that would enrich the soil for corn. They, they would do things like crop rotation. You know, where, where they would, and, and, and that happened a lot um, in Iowa. They, one year you would see this field in corn, and next year you would see it in wheat. And then every once in a while you see the same field just planted in grass. I thought it was amazing. They would plant grass. It's like, really? Just let it grow up. <laughs> Weeds, but they wanted it for the cattle and, you know, bailing the hay. So they wanted to make a little, but they planted grass. Let it, just kind of let it lay fallow, if you will, to put nutrients back in. They, um, and they were interested in greater yields, you know, to not use a parcel of land and let it set so that next year they knew that they would have a great yield, a great harvest, great fruitfulness. And what I'm, when the reason I bring all this out is, is I, I want to share with you that I think this Jesus was saying is the same principles apply, that, that we need to pay attention to our heart, to the dirt, if you will where it is. You see, if you come to church and you don't get anything out of church, most likely it's because you didn't pay any attention to the heart. Your spirit wasn't in it. You didn't come prepared. You didn't come ready. See, what I have found is that no matter what, no matter, no matter if the preacher was way off, if I go to a church and I go in with the heart and the mindset that Jesus, I just want to meet with you, teach me something that I find God never fails me. And I find that even if I didn't like one song in the worship segment, that God still meets with me. If my heart is right and my soil is good and I've paid attention and I've gotten up and I, I say this every week or every morning, every week, yeah, every morning. In fact, I get up at four in the morning and I say, okay, Lord, I have no clue how you're going to use me today at work, but I'm in. Use me, please. And I go to work. I, have, I, was, I was sharing with Judy this morning at work that I have this one guy. He is, um, um, I won't tell you his name, but I mean, he's just kind of nasty critter. You, you know what I mean? He won't, I, good morning to him. And the first morning, you know, I said good morning to him because he worked his department right next to my department. And so when we load up the carts and we're putting stuff on the shelves and, and I said to him, good morning, he didn't say a word. I thought, okay. He doesn't even look at me. You know, he just avoids me. 
I thought, okay, so I put a smile on my face. There's always tomorrow, and I go in, good morning. You know, the next time he's, good morning. How are you? How are you? Not a word. And so after being there a few months, uh, um, I went to him. There was one there's green. It doesn't really matter, but I went to him with a question, and, and he just he didn't want to answer my question. He didn't want anything to do with me. And he was just like, well, that's, I, I, I was saying, I'm looking for the green labels because that's a special order and you got to set it aside. Did you see green labels? And what happened was is on the pallet of stuff that they give us, merchandise that they give us, we had that day is a mixed pallet. It's got some plumbing where he works and it's got some electrical where I work. And, and so I'm taking stuff off and I'm setting stuff on a cart for him thinking I'm helping him out, you know. And, uh, and I asked him, I said, this says that there's green labels. Have you seen any green labels? No, I haven't seen anything. Okay. Good morning. The other day we had some, some pipes that you put up. Uh, for me, it's conduit. For him, it's, it's actually pipes. But it all looks the same, just different colors to me. And uh, my racks are full, and so we have some racks outside, and, and there's nobody there but him. And I, and I went to him, I said, what, you know, I have all this conduit that don't fit in here. Do I take it outside? And he said, I, I work plumbing. Okay, yeah, I know. I said, well, what do you do with plumbing? Do you take it outside? Is that what we do with it? You know, he said, well, go ask your boss. Well, my boss is not here. It's just me. And that day I was thinking about it as I was doing my job and thinking about him. And, and I thought, Lord, you know, he's, he's to be pitied. And then I realized, Lord, he's a project. If you can change an ordinary critter like me, if I began to ask you to help him and use me, you can change him. So I go in, I go in and I tell him good morning, and he just doesn't look at me. I say hi to him as we pass. He doesn't say a word. That's okay. He doesn't have to say a word. I know that whom I and I am persuaded that he is able. And I just say, Lord, bless that man. Reach him. Make him see what you want to do for him. Let him know that his life. I'm, I'm beginning to wonder, you know, is his life just bad? Nothing good ever happens for him? Is, is, is he one of, I mean, people live like that, right? It's bad stuff, one after another. So he got it tough. So he got to work three jobs, and I'm just pain in his neck. Make me a good pain, will you? Make me a growing pain. Make me a blessing and not a curse in his life. See, God wasn't changing him. Who's God changing? Me. When I first saw him, I thought, what a nasty character. Nobody needs to be that mean. That's not what I see now. I don't see him the same way at all. But he didn't change. I did. God's after greater yields. But I don't think it's just in others. I think it's in us. The dirt is a... Uh, I'm looking at the time. The dirt is a good indicator, barometer, I think I have up here, Adam, of the heart condition. Um... Dirt, Jesus was saying, the heart, you know, I'll, I'll see if I can do this, Adam. I don't, I'm not sure. Um, it, it is a barometer. Um, there, Jesus, Jesus, actually there's different kinds of dirt. Jesus talked about it. He said, there's the, the hardened dirt, the, 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 what he referred to the path and he said, as he described it, he said, Satan comes in and, and he snatches it. He's just, just hard. And there are people with hard hearts. Maybe my friend has a hard heart. I don't know. I don't know. I don't. But I could. You know, I could just look, look at him and just say, forget you. And it would be my heart, just a little harder. It would be my heart, just a little more insensitive. It would be my heart getting calloused. And then there's the, the rocky, shallow, I mean, it's so full of rocks, just 
overcrowded with rocks where there's not a lot of room for dirt, not a lot of places for the roots to get deep. And Jesus said that persecution Uh, persecution or ridicule or peer pressure snatches it away. I think that's what we're seeing in the church. Instead of allowing God's word to mandate to us what is marriage and what isn't marriage, we've got some churches and and they just, there's no no room in their hearts for God's word to take root. And so they don't, they make bad decisions based on emotions and about all the stuff from the world that's crowding in. And I think we need to, we need to make sure that we, as we work on the dirt of ourselves that we start clearing out some of the rocks. One of the things that I noticed in Iowa is they had to have those big wagons. Do you remember this? You probably had to do a little of this, Claire. And you go out in the field and they picked rocks. They paid people to pick rocks and throw it into the, into the bucket of the, of, the, of the front loader, and then they would dump it onto the, onto the wagon. And I would see out beside the fields all these wagon loads of rocks, and it's like, man, they've got a rock quarry going. But what fascinated me about it is you could go to the same field, and next year there would be even more rocks. I mean, I'm, and we know if you a garden, you know, you get out there and you till it up, and the next year it's like, where do all these rocks come from? And our lives get filled with rocks. The church is too busy, too busy to hear the word, too busy to listen to the word, too busy to see what God wants to do in our lives because of all the rocks. And so God's word can't get deep into us and change us. And Jesus said there's the thorny ground or the thorny dirt. The life is choked out of it. Sort of like, um, I learned this. I learned a lot about farming in Iowa. I, I don't know why I didn't learn as much in, in Ohio because I'm a Buckeye born and raised. But in, in Iowa, I discovered in, in, with corn that there's what they call suckers. Georgia, you're, you're an old farmer, aren't you? You know what a sucker is, right? Yeah, it's the guy gets down in front of his knees in front of his wife. Is that, is that it? Huh? Uh, yeah, you knew you were going to hear that. No, there are plants that come alongside the corn stalk that, that, that sucks the yield. The cares of the world, Jesus says, just sucks the life. We don't... The word just gets choked out. And that I think he finds I find it interesting that he said the, the deceitfulness of rich riches. One of the things that you know, going back to work, one of the things I want to always remember is it's just a job. Not a career. They want me to make it a career. They love my work. The reason they love my work is because I work as unto the Lord. I'm waiting for when they give me that 10 cent raise that they're going to give me because we're going to have a go round. I'm worth more than 10 cents an hour or more. And I'm going to tell them so. I work as unto the Lord and I expect you, the Lord says, is that the workman is worth his hire. Pay me. I won't be mean about it, but I'm going to be matter of fact about it. It's the word of God, is it not? I give you what the word tells me to give you. I expect you to give me what the word of God tells you to give me. And I'm going to write a little letter and hand it in and get my 10 cents and keep on working for Jesus. I doubt it will make much of a difference, but I'll let them know. Because it's the Word of God. It's my chance to preach to a crowd who didn't gather in to listen. And then he said, there's the good soil that produces. Ah, it produces. And I'd like to just a, a closing point, really. Betty, you know what closing points are, right? That means I'm going to talk for another 20 minutes. Well, one of the points that I'd like to make is Jesus never said in the, about that good soil that there, there wasn't weeds, that there wasn't rocks. What, what, I, what I would like to share with you is I, I just think that the good soil was tended to. Some intentionality, some rock picking, if you will. Farmers aren't going to ruin their equipment. You know, pay somebody to go out there and help them pick up the rocks. 
that the, the good soil produced, but it still had rocks and it still had weeds that had to be dealt with. I think that's the whole point of what Jesus is saying. I'm not going to do the illustration, Adam. I think the point's been made. I had a really cool illustration I was going to show you about a barometer and how you can test things. But let me just say this about the soil. The soil is a barometer for Jesus. It is the test of our hearts. Okay. I find it fascinating and at the same time alarming that the majority, the multitudes, had God the Son walking right in front of their eyes. Working miracles and not see it. They had not Pastor Carl preaching passionately. They had Jesus, the Son of God, preaching with great authority and not hear it. I find it fascinating that a lot of them were teachers. You know, those of us who've got a little age on us and like a little Bible reading in us, and we think we know it all. Or at least they did. And so Jesus had nothing to offer them. Isn't that fascinating? God himself in their midst. And they can't see it. They can't perceive it. They can't understand it. And they don't know it. They could not see God right in front of them. Well, I need to be done. I think Jesus really does mean this to be more than just evangelism. Although I think it is to be an evangelistic tool and we need to learn from it. We in the church need to be patient with one another as well. And that we need to be uh, kind to each other and know that everybody is growing at their own rate. Some people get a little miracle growth from Jesus and some of us don't. We just don't shine quite as bright, and we don't get quite as big, and we aren't the, the show tomato, if you know what I'm saying. But it's okay. We're still God's tomato. Amen? How's your yield? How's your yield today?